It's been three years since I played Catherine for the first time and was inadvertently introduced to Atlas's catalog of games. It was the perfect game for me to start with, seeing as Atlas had made a name for themselves with RPGs and Catherine dialed those elements way back. See, throughout my life, I've never been the biggest fan of the genre, specifically those with turn-based combat. There are a select few that have managed to keep me captivated, most notably for their pacing or novel mechanical ideas. Outside of those, I'd try time and time again and I'd end up exhausted playing the popular favorites. Catherine was far removed from all of that. It was a tense puzzle game that required careful calculation, game sense, and advanced techniques. It was addicting, and I'd imagine Vincent pushing and pulling those blocks even while I was lying in my bed at night. But the puzzle solving wasn't the only thing that kept me going. Obviously, Catherine's main hook is its story about a man with commitment issues. It's your job to guide him through his relationship, or relationships, in an optimal fashion. Choose what would be best for him, project your own desires, and be prepared to face the consequences of your actions. I adore the parts of the game that take place in the Stray Sheep, as you converse with your friends and the regulars in an effort to expand Vincent's views and better or worsen his moral compass. You can get drunk and learn some neat alcohol trivia, or play some Rapunzel to sharpen your skills in the nightmares. It was a nice way to relax before a stressful night of puzzles, and the wonderful bar music certainly helped. It's a chill jazz tune that immediately jailed with me, and I've been listening to it while I work ever since. But by far, the part that floored me most when I played this game for the first time was the ability to send custom text messages to both of Vincent's love interests. This kind of personalization is so rare in games, and I was ready to give this game a standing ovation right then and there. All of this allowed me to connect with both the characters and narrative to the furthest extent I could have ever hoped for. I was in awe. I genuinely wanted things to end well, and I felt responsible for making that happen. After finishing the game, I thought to myself, man, Atlas is known for their RPGs then, right? In that case, if they had already made a stellar RPG that nailed both storytelling and gameplay with unique narrative devices, social and personal elements, intelligent mechanics, and calculated strategy, and it flew under my radar this whole time, I'd have to play it soon. Mind you, I was playing Catherine while the rest of the world was just getting their hands on Persona 5, so you can imagine how many recommendations I was getting. All things considered, Persona sounded like it was made for me. I'd have to play it someday. Not long after I had finished playing Catherine, Persona 5's deep cultural impact was in full effect. All of my socials were full of videos, screenshots, fan art, quotes and references that I didn't understand, the works. It was like a small scale phenomenon amongst my friends and acquaintances. I even listened to some of the soundtrack for the first time and I was blown away by its beautiful vocals, orchestral rock, and obvious Jamiroquai influences. It was yet another glimpse into a game, or rather, game series, that seemed perfect for me. I'd have to play it eventually. Now I kept telling myself that I'd play it soon, or eventually, and the more I told myself that, the longer I'd be putting it off. Although Persona had piqued my interest, it was still a pretty big commitment. I was starting college soon and I wanted to continue working away at my YouTube channel while it showed its first signs of growth. Taking time away from either of those things for a long game in a genre that I didn't necessarily love was a scary prospect. And if I did end up loving it, I'd probably binge the game straight through to the end. I was caught in this endless cycle, and it prevented me from actually biting the bullet. Fast forward to the summer of 2019. I'm finished with college, and I'm focusing on YouTube full time as I attempt to keep the snowball rolling downhill. I needed to take a break and play something new, something I wouldn't usually play. I remembered Persona and I decided that it was finally time to give it a shot. I chose to start with Persona 4, due to its unique small town murder mystery setting, and so that I could appreciate the series' mechanics before jumping into the more streamlined Persona 5. So there I am, on a chill summer afternoon, trying to get through Yukiko's castle. I have zero strategy and zero game sense whatsoever. I die to the first boss, and I'm sent back to my last save. I've lost all of my new Personas, and I have to trek through the floors I've already completed all over again. Usually, this would be enough for me to put the game down. It was my fault that this happened, of course, but it's not exactly motivating when you lose progress. And yet, for some reason, I kept playing. I wanted to learn from what I'd done wrong, and push forward with my new knowledge. I'd carefully fuse my personas next time, and properly buff or debuff in accordance with my enemy. But why was I thinking this? What drove me to keep playing despite the slow build-up to this dungeon and the significant loss of progress and time? These were my initial thoughts as I cleared Yukiko's castle and prepped for the road ahead. 
Something about Persona 4 was special, and I just couldn't put my finger on it. It was too early to tell. I eventually put the game down with the intention of revisiting it on a rainy day. And... That rainy day sure did come. Days become weeks, weeks become months. Time is a nebulous concept as we await an end to this current... situation. So we're all sitting inside on a June afternoon when suddenly... Atlas murders the PlayStation Vita by porting Persona 4 Golden to PC. Its stealth drops, becomes a smash hit, as expected, and the world rejoices. The time to jump back into Inaba drew nearer for me, and I decided to do so as soon as I finished my Team Fortress 2 video. That brings us to the present. I've spent a good chunk of my summer playing Persona. Sometimes I play it for 9 hours straight. Sometimes I don't play at all. But I'm always thinking about it. The stories, characters, gameplay, music, and atmosphere always stay in my mind. I played through three of the Persona games, and I intend on finishing games like Persona 2, Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, and hell, maybe I'll even finish some other JRPG like Xenoblade Chronicles. Persona single-handedly conditioned me to a genre that once endlessly intimidated me, with writing and gameplay that felt like they were made for me. Today, I'll be taking you through my unfiltered Persona experience, from start to finish. I'll be detailing my decisions throughout each game, my thoughts on its mechanics, a breakdown of why the stories and characters resonate with me, and how this series has legitimately changed my life. I'm Liam Triforce, and this is how I fell in love with Persona. So in order to give you the full scoop, let's rewind to the very beginning. A very good friend of mine describes the setting of Persona 4 to me on a whim. I have little to no prior knowledge of the series, or Megami Tensei in general. I'm fascinated by the game's rural town Inaba. Usually RPGs take you on grand journeys through vast areas and varied locales, and even if they're confined to a semi-grounded setting like Pokemon, they still feel fictitious and exaggerated. RPGs have always taken strides to allow the player to escape and play a great part in the world far removed from their own. But Persona 4 decided to keep the player in a small town in Japan. Inaba faithfully adapts Fuefuki of the Yamanashi Prefecture. It's located two hours away from Tokyo on the outskirts of Mount Fuji. Just from glancing over some photos of this place, it's clear to me why Atlas looked to this town for inspiration. It's a Japanese equivalent to Springfield, a town that everyone seems to know and can relate to. Although I grew up in a small town just outside of Toronto with an eighth of Yamanashi's population, it's easy for me to feel nostalgic for this place, even though I've never been there. Just looking at this shot of the Shell gas station reminds me of the street where I used to go over to my friend's house for pool parties in Halo. Aeon reminds me of the supermarket my mom would drag me to while shopping for groceries. I hated going there, but I have fond memories of picking out the snacks I wanted for school. There are parts of Inaba that are pretty much exclusive spots to Japanese residents, but they feel comfortable and soothing. The Samegoa floodplain in-game, as well as that familiar walkway that you can probably spot in other Japanese media, both feel right at home. It all cultivates an atmosphere unquestionably grounded in reality. Obviously, the entire game doesn't take place on the streets of Inaba. The concept of going into the TV and seeing the character's true desires take shape in the form of a dungeon also intrigued me, and I was grateful to see they limited those excursions so that they'd have more of an emotional weight. The game was not just about a group of high schoolers banding together to solve a murder case, but it was also about self-discovery and confrontation. I also heard murmurs about characters that struggle with sexuality and gender, and I thought to myself, okay, surely this is going to be a fantastic coming-of-age story about pursuing your true self, but with subject matter this heavy, they'd better handle this with care. I need the characters to feel believable, and I need the mystery to feel, well, mysterious. If they were both truly great, these two elements would definitely carry me through the game. My interest had been piqued, and I started my playthrough. Now, it's worth mentioning that Persona 4 had a pretty decent cultural impact over here in Canada when it came out, so I was aware of a few of its elements. I had heard the game's intro before, and I was aware of the character Risei years before playing this game. The former was introduced to me through some cheeky references across YouTube that I didn't understand at the time, and the latter was seemingly everyone's favorite character for reasons I had yet to find out. After watching that commercial she appears in at the beginning of the game, I came to the premature conclusion that it was just because people thought she was pretty. Oh, my innocent mind. Anyway, I'm introduced to the Velvet Room, I meet up with my uncle Dojima and my cousin Nanako, I shake some person's hand at a gas station, and then we head home. 
Immediately, I seem to connect with these two. Although the writing is kept simple, that's exactly why it works. They're realistic characters that deal with realistic, everyday problems. Dojima, although constantly busy with work as a detective, seemed to be a caring father. He's also like that one uncle you have that you don't know very well, but he's a great guy so you can be friendly with him. But that causes Nanako to sit at home alone, every day, accepting the reality of her situation. And that hit hard. Nanako's life is pretty bleak for a seven-year-old. She sits inside most of the time, watching TV. She doesn't always have her father to accompany her. And you're going to school six days a week and hanging out with your friends. She's also the one that's preparing breakfast for everyone. I'm sure she enjoys it, but the amount of responsibility she has to take on at her age is pretty crazy to digest. I hated seeing her unhappy, and I wanted to do what I could to mend the relationship between Dojima and Nanako. Also, semi-unrelated note, the music that plays at home is a bop. Signs of Love is really evocative of that just got home from school on a Friday afternoon atmosphere. A lot of the everyday music is like that. It maintains this pop vibe throughout in accordance with the weather. It fits the Smallville Japan setting of this game like a glove, and it made me think fondly of the daily commute I made around town while in high school. I never thought twice about that shit back then, and Persona 4 is making me relive it nostalgically. Anyway, let's get back on track. In the morning, I head off to school and I'm introduced to the gang of misfits that I'll be hanging out with over the course of the game. Yosuke Hanamura, Chie Satanaka, and Yukiko Amagi. Yosuke felt like your average buddy character, but something about him felt genuine from the get-go. First of all, his English voice actor is Yuri Lowenthal who happens to be one of my favorite voice actors, period. Yeah, he might show up in virtually everything, but that happens for a reason. He has this unparalleled ability to convey emotion, and he pronounces Japanese names almost effortlessly. And as I'd soon come to realize, there's more to Yosuke than just being a goofy friend character. See, although he messes up a lot and he constantly gets dunked on by those around him, all he really wants is approval. He's afraid of being alone, and that fear is accentuated by the fact that he's been thrust into the countryside and out of the big city, where he had some sense of familiarity. This is brought to the forefront when he has to confront those fears in the form of his shadow. He was still dealing with Saki's murder, and yet he was forced to face the fact that her death was the excitement he needed in his depressing, mundane life out in Inaba. This was a pretty strong introduction to Persona 4's core concepts of pursuing your true self and seeking truth in life. I cared a lot more about Yosuke because of this. He wasn't just the comic relief character, he was the backbone of each adventure. He had this infectious, hot-blooded energy that everyone needed, including me. Actually, that's a pretty apt description of Chie as well. Her upbeat nature is similarly contagious. Basically, these two seemed like the perfect companions for a game like this. Everything around you has this atmosphere of uncertainty and dread, and yet, those two were there to back me up. They're dependable, optimistic, and strong. Yukiko was the only character I couldn't get a read on at first, but that was only because she had an arc to go through. I wanted to help her because she seemed like she was being held back by the Amagi Inn, similar to how Yosuke was being held back by his repressed fears. In an effort to save her, our heroes catch on to the correlation between people showing up on TV and fog rolling in the next day with a corpse showing up, and resolve to save Yukiko before the three days of rain come by. Now by the time Persona 4 finally loosens its grip and gives you the freedom to tackle the game as you wish, Nearly three hours might have passed. Maybe more, maybe less, depends on the player. Normally, I hate when games are slow to start, but I was in love with this one so far. One of my key criteria for enjoying this game right off the bat was that it had to have believable characters. It introduced realistic characters that shared realistic relationships across the board, and it gave you glimpses into their lives throughout. My revelation about Yosuke, Nanako's isolation, Dojima's work life, Chie's jealousy, and Yukiko losing control of her life all contribute to this intense desire to uncover more of this game's world. I cared about these characters an immense deal, and I hadn't put that much time into the game considering its overall length. Unquestionably, the struggles the high school characters grapple with in their fight against their shadows are reflective of real life issues that most high schoolers face, and I was ready to get a lot more of that commentary going forward. The mystery itself seemed to have some rhyme or reason, and I was able to play an active part in solving the case. My intrigue turned to investment at this point, and even though I was mostly jamming the A button through cutscenes, I had a clear goal, and I had reason to fight. And even with this at hand, it's not like there isn't any gameplay in these first moments. Persona 4's gameplay tutorials were cleverly implemented and eased me into what would eventually become a brutal, yet engrossing and rewarding RPG. First off, the dialogue options during cutscenes offer a beautiful assortment of personalized flavor text. And that's all I thought they were going to be. 
until I showed up for my first day of school. I stood my ground against King Moron like a badass, and what do you know, I'm rewarded for it. In this moment, I'm taught that what I say can have positive and negative effects on my playthrough, and I learn about social stats. After hanging out with Yosuke for the first time, you're eventually informed of the effects relationship building can have on the game. Now I love a good sim game, and Persona 4 was scratching that itch wonderfully. My decisions were guiding my playthrough in the long run, and I had the opportunity to become close to my friends by listening to their problems and responding appropriately based on the personality and mood. I could build a reputation for myself and level up my social stats in order to take on bigger challenges or talk to people more eloquently and courageously. I needed to carefully consider when I should spend time doing certain activities, and everything that I was doing was paying tremendous dividends. And that's not all. The concepts of battle are simple, but a lot of factors go into singling out weaknesses and turning the tides of battle. With every weakness struck, you get another turn, as long as you're not hitting the same enemy. I could fuse personas in accordance with the enemies up ahead, I could summon old personas for useful abilities, I could strategize by buffing with my party members, etc. Everything falls into place effortlessly, and as soon as you need to think carefully about the days ahead, you have a pretty clear idea of the balancing act you need to perform. The more I would play, the more I would learn. This learning process never ends with Persona 4, and all of those elements created an endlessly addicting feedback loop. From this moment on, I was in love with Persona 4. I was compelled by its world and engrossed at its gameplay. Its sim elements played into its core RPG elements, and its RPG elements were simple yet wonderfully designed. This game was made for me. But let's get down to brass tacks. How exactly did Persona 4 carry me to the end? What makes it work? Well, let's start with what hooked me. The gameplay. Although the majority of the game is spent outside of dungeons hanging out with friends, those moments where you do end up climbing through a dungeon are special and you'd better be prepared. Persona 4 proved to be a tough game, but that's what made it so much fun. As you climb through the procedurally generated floors, you'll get a taste of what level you should be and what prep work needs to be done. You'll be able to practice sweeping those powerful enemies by targeting weak points. You can test the usefulness of certain buffs or debuffs, until finally you face off against the boss. They'll always attempt to single out weaknesses, deal massive amounts of damage, or prevent your characters from performing crucial skills, and it's your job to figure out what works best. Because of this, I always saw bosses in Persona 4 as puzzles. No matter what my level was, I could always figure out a way to make it by the skin of my teeth. Since Yukiko's shadow is weak to fire, all I had to do was focus on that and keep wailing on her. When she'd summon her prince or use fire break, I'd focus the prince or attack defend accordingly. With the sauna boss, I'd have to single out the enemies that are weak to fire and ice and put the pressure on them first, while guarding with my main character to ensure I'd survive the powerful attacks. When a boss threatens to silence my party and prevent them from using their personas, I'd have to ensure that they could avoid the attacks and keep a medic on standby to lift the silence. If a boss were to charge a devastating attack, I'd have to make damn sure that I'd guard, lower its offense, or both. No risks. If a boss were to raise its stats or nullify our elemental resistances, there were spells I could use to tank the damage ahead. There are many, many ways to approach these bosses, however, and there isn't ever a correct answer. The creative yet unmistakably intense combat in Persona 4 ended up being some of the most fun I've had with an RPG. This feedback loop of buffing, attacking, charging, defending, and healing may not be new to the genre, but it's handled with simplicity and complexity at the same time. Although it's a turn-based game, I was thinking one step ahead as if it were a strategy game. Persona 4 is basically chess, and I love it. Viewing the game's combat under a lens like this made me appreciate it so much more. It allowed me to relax a little bit and prepare for what was ahead. Because with every new dungeon comes a new challenge and new tests of knowledge. And as long as I had the necessary tools, I could come out on top, despite overwhelming odds. Now ensuring that I'd have the tools to deal with these puzzles is easier said than done. But that's where intelligent fusion comes into play. Upon climbing Yukiko's castle, I would collect personas with elements that I didn't have access to yet. However, these default personas would not be enough to kill a boss. In preparation, I fused a fire persona and kept Izanagi on standby just in case, and sure enough, I was able to obliterate the boss with patience. Fusion ended up being an incredibly addicting process. I was so excited to create the next ultimate persona. I try to maintain a balance between ability variety and stat adherence, and I'd create multiple personas so that I'd have a backup plan in case my party needed healing, or I needed to switch between elemental or physical attacks. Collecting personas can also lead to pentagon fusions, which allow you to fuse some of the most powerful personas in the game. Black Frost is easily my favorite persona in the entire game because he can absorb both fire and ice, he can charge up insanely powerful attacks of both elements, and I mean, come on. Hee-ho, dude. 
The point is, Persona 4's combat may not be the most revolutionary, but it is easily the most streamlined yet endlessly deep and rewarding combat systems I've seen in an RPG. It takes a concept commonly associated with Pokemon and makes that the focal point of each fight without it ever getting stale. Of course, there are blunders in this game's combat and dungeon crawling. Inactive party members do not receive XP, which means if you feel like you might need to switch out party members later down the line in order to adjust your strategy, you'll definitely have to grind them up to a higher level or accept the fact that they'll get one shot by most attacks. Also, in order to figure out an enemy's weakness, most of the time it's a complete guessing game. With really powerful enemies, wasting turns trying to figure out what an enemy's weakness is might just get you killed. Then again, that's part of the learning process. I like it, Kaji. You can't be expected to figure things out immediately, just like you can't understand how a new chess opponent is going to play until you're a few turns deep. In fact, that might also be a huge part of why I was okay with dying to Shadow Yukiko in the beginning. Or, you know, any of the bosses. I had learned something with that attempt. I wasn't unlucky, it was my fault. And I knew what I could do to succeed on my next attempt. Lots of lateral thinking, defensive maneuvers, and patience. The only other thing I really dislike about this game's gameplay are some of the dungeon gimmicks. I'm fine with a confusing maze or a search for a key that only spans like one floor, but only being informed of the key after you've climbed 11 floors is a bit shite, and it felt like an obnoxious waste of time. In one of the final dungeons, you have to avoid touching enemies while proceeding through the floor. The game was clearly not designed for you to be able to dodge these enemies, especially in a narrow corridor, and the long spiraling strip that you have to walk through just hurts. But those are my only problems with this game's gameplay. I mean, maybe I don't like the sleuthing aspects before you proceed to the next dungeon, where you ask people for information and they tell you shit you already knew, but any problem I have with Persona 4 seems negligible in the face of a combat system that has conditioned me to the role-playing genre single-handedly. And if the combat weren't enough, the characters definitely would be. This game's events revolve around the arcs its characters go through. With each arc, you get a little closer to the truth, but not before the game tackles hard-hitting issues. Remember how I mentioned that Nanako and Dojima felt real to me because they dealt with relatable issues? Well, that's exactly what the game zeroes in on. Everyone has their demons. And facing them and choking those problems out are the only way to truly conquer them and live a happier life. The game makes it blatantly obvious from the get-go that this is its thesis. Once the strength of heart required to face oneself has been made manifest, only then can one see the truth. It dives into the heart of the problems that most troubled high schoolers face, and puts these problems under a mainstream lens. And even outside of that stuff, it deals with some pretty intense yet grounded thematic content. After Yukiko's castle appears, the game lets you go wild. You're able to spend your time however you like, and everything you do with your allotted time matters. The most important task is leveling up your social links, as they allow you to infuse greater power into your personas, fuse some awesome ones, and they grant party members new abilities but it's a balancing act. Sometimes you'll need to level up your social stats in order to proceed with the social links, as is the case with Nanako for example. It's not easy to help a 7 year old with serious issues, so you'll need to increase your expression. Increasing your expression could mean answering questions in class correctly, attending drama club, or spending your evenings translating Japanese into English. Every activity in this game has some benefit, and seeking those benefits out when the time comes is what I love about this game. It's an enveloping micromanagement system. The social links themselves expand on character sensitivities and problems a great deal, and they're easily my favorite part about this game. With a story so inviting and intriguing, having the opportunity to seek out more information about these characters I care so deeply about is a wonderful thing. And while there are social links for different students and people around Inaba that I found myself invested in, they don't really hold a candle to the social links for the game's primary cast. From here, I'll discuss both primary plot events and how they're interconnected with the game's wonderful social links. Let's start with Yosuke, since he's the first character I really connected with. Earlier ranks are somewhat light on thematic content and touch upon his sudden shift in lifestyle. And he's the son of Juness's manager, the shopping mall that is single-handedly putting local shops out of business. However, there are a few things early on that hint towards his struggles. First of all, people gossip about Juness in front of him, and two part-timers complain to him when the manager forces them to come in on weekends. On top of that, when Yosuke got a spam message out in Okina, he mentioned that he didn't think anyone would want to text him anyway. See where this is going? Not only did he not retain any relationships from back home, but no one sees him for who he really is in Inaba. And when you consider that the one person he thought had warmed up to him actually hated him, it's not a stretch to say that Yosuke is suffering. Because of this, I wanted to hang out with Yosuke. I wanted to listen to his stupid ramblings. I wanted to be his friend. 
These issues come to a head when the part-timers start bad-mouthing Saki in front of him. He explodes at them, and later confides in you as he openly grieves Saki for the first time. This allows him to move on properly, and he learns to cherish the people that are around him. Yosuke was the first character to really teach me that in Persona, your party members aren't just your party members. They can also be your best friends. Now let's move on to Chie. At first, I felt like all she was going to talk about was Stake and Trial of the Dragon. Her shadow did hint at some personal issues, but I don't necessarily think they ended up being the focal point of her social link. Instead, they went even further beyond. Chie has a tomboyish personality. She seems to be reluctant to show signs of femininity in her social link, and that's why she gets embarrassed when she freaks out over a bug. She's still holding on to some feelings of inferiority when compared to Yukiko. It doesn't help that this Takashi loser is constantly making her feel that way. At the same time, she really wants to remain the person that she is. She constantly trains to be like the action movie hero she loves, and that subtle nerdiness is pretty charming. In the end, she comes to the conclusion that she should follow her heart and protect those close to her, including you. Yukiko's social link is an extension of her desires to break free from the chains of her family's inn and gain independence. As she confides in you and discusses her ventures in independence, like refining her cooking and getting a job, she also develops a crush on you. Probably because you're the first boy in her life that actually listens to her instead of treating her like a game that they have to win at. Eventually, she gains the confidence to tell off some grimy reporters, and she realizes that leaving the inn behind would betray the trust of those closest to her. It would be selfish to leave. Her parents are providing for her, and the least she could do is give back. It doesn't mean she has to stay shackled to the inn. All three of these characters deal with very common teenage issues, and considering they're the first characters you work with on the case, it's a nice way to ease you into the game's subject matter. But here's where things get really intense. When I mentioned the game putting high school problems under a mainstream lens, I wasn't just talking about the common problems. Persona 4 sheds light on a few choice issues that are of utmost significance, and although the game is a little shaky with them on occasion, at least from a westerner's perspective, they're handled with grace overall, and I believe it solidifies Persona 4 as a landmark video game that was way ahead of its time. First, we have Kanji Tatsumi, son of the owners of Tatsumi Textiles and Inaba's infamous delinquent. Your first impression of him isn't supposed to be very positive, but that night, he shows up on the Midnight Channel, just like Saki and Yukiko before him. As the gang tails him, they find out he's made plans to meet up with a boy his age. Once Kanji catches wind of them finding this out, he tries his best to convince them that they've got the wrong idea. Already, I could kinda see where this was going. Then he appeared on the Midnight Channel again. Hello, dear viewers. It's time for Bad Bad Bathhouse. Tonight I'll introduce a superb sight for those searching for sublime love that surpasses the separation of the sexes. They sure weren't going for subtlety anymore. And to be honest, I quite like how the dungeons exaggerate these traits. We saw a bit of this with Yukiko, but Kanji's shadow dials things up to 11. Essentially, Kanji's shadow represents his insecurities over his hobbies that are considered stereotypically feminine, and his embarrassment over girls harassing him for it. And when that mysterious kid came along, it got the ball rolling for him to question his own romantic interests as well. It's worth mentioning that I believe this is also a partial commentary on how bullying can affect kids growing up. Bullying is particularly vicious in Japanese schools, where conforming to social norms is important. If you are different in any minute way, you become a target. In Kanji's case, he's being torn apart by this stuff. He loves to knit and sew, and that made him a target. In retaliation, he developed a bit of a rough exterior. So when you consider that he might also be struggling with his sexual orientation amidst all of this, you can imagine how reluctant he was to accept that. I think the music in his dungeon represents this well. You've got the pulse-pounding club beat that is immediately drowned out by a gnarly drum solo, an obvious representation of Kanji's refusal to accept who he really is. He finally reflects on this after you rescue him, and it's a moment that still sticks out to me in my mind. I don't know where my head was at. When I came to my senses, I blurted out that I wanted to see him again. Girls are so loud and obnoxious, so, you know, I, I really don't like dealing with them. Guys are a lot more laid back. So, uh, I started thinking, what if I'm the type who never gets interested in girls? And I couldn't accept that, 
so I kept spinning around and around in my head. Of course, the investigation team is willing to accept him and everything about him. Finally, Kanji has someone, anyone to talk to about these feelings with, and his social link further expands on this, making a new doll for a kid and just being a kind soul, even when he might want to reject that part of him. But that's him, and he's that. Now the reason all of this is so important is because Persona 4 brought all of this to light in a setting with high schoolers that have a very heteronormative mindset. Not only is this liberating for kids that might be going through the same exact thing, but it also might have made kids think twice about picking on someone just because they're perceived differently. Kanji being a hilarious and entertaining character in his own right is just the cherry on top. The way these struggles clash with his personality end up making for some of the most memorable and resonant moments in the game. Kanji is afraid of being rejected most of all, and confronting that fear means accepting that people will love you most if you're true to yourself. The game doesn't let up with this kind of stuff. Enter Risei Kujikawa, a popular idol that recently took a break citing poor health. She's actually helping out at Marukyu Tofu, her family shop. One of the first things I noticed is that she wasn't anything like her bubbly self that was being depicted in the media, and that's exactly what the game wants you to be thinking. Here's the thing, Risei took the job in the first place in order to convince people that she was worth talking to, because she thought that being herself wasn't enough. But as she came to realize, being an idol means selling a fictionalized version of yourself to the public. The stress and pressure coming from being in the industry eventually boil over, and when she appears in the Midnight Channel, it's a little disturbing. While Risei learns that she doesn't need to be an idol in order to win people over, there's a bigger commentary within. The idol industry can be extremely exploitative and rigorous in Japan. Agencies often prohibit idols from dating in order to maintain a perverse fantasy for their fans. They force idols to work under strict schedules, and there's also a sickening and blatant presence of sexualization in the industry. This kind of stress is extremely unhealthy for a young girl like her, and you can see a lot of that spill out in the Madoku striptease. It has this air of fabricated, unsettling eroticism that echoes throughout. Risei went through all of this at only 16, and her social link comments further on this toxicity. As awesome as she might have thought it would be to finally win people over, she didn't anticipate what it would cost and how far she would end up regressing. While saving her from the dungeon and working on her social link, it was clear to me why people connected with this girl so easily. What she goes through is impossible to ignore, and I ended up getting anxious on her behalf. Risei is another example of what being true to yourself can do, in a completely different context. An eye-opener for the kids, or anyone for that matter, who took the idol industry at face value, and a really fun character to boot. Laura Bailey is her English voice actress, and she must have had a lot of fun recording for her. What's their problem? They make me act like a ditz, call me resent and stuff, and then say I'm a kid? It's so obvious. Those rap parties get a lot funner after I go home. Throughout the game, this mysterious detective kid follows the gang around. She is eventually revealed to be Naoto Shirogane, the prodigal detective prince of Inaba. After the gang defeats Mitsuo Kubo's shadow, the person who was believed to be the culprit at the time, Naoto remains suspicious and investigates the case further. Now, her gender isn't actually revealed to be female until you confront her shadow, although her Midnight Channel program hints at this from the beginning. She assumed a male identity in order to avoid sexism under the police department, but ever since an early age, she has taken interest in stuff that is stereotypically boys stuff. It's clear that she wanted to be male for a long time. When you face her shadow, it's evident that Naoto is dealing with gender dysphoria, and at this point I was in awe. In 2008, I can't think of anything that I'd watched or played that even touched upon a subject like this. Gender dysphoria was only recognized legally very recently in Japan. Back then, things were tough. And because of all this, Naoto is hesitant to fully embrace being male. She states that she can never truly be male. Not because it's impossible, but because society may deem it unacceptable. Of course, the investigation team accepts her, and she decides what she really wants is to be true to herself. She shouldn't have to conform to the police department's misogynistic rules to be an ace detective. Why should her gender have anything to do with her job performance? After finishing the game, I thought about her situation a lot. It's kind of an inverse of Kanji's situation, even if they leave much less room for this to be ambiguous. And hey, she does accept her feminine side on her own. No one forces it on her. Much like Kanji doesn't quite fit a specific label for his sexual orientation, Naoto doesn't need to conform to gender binarism either. 
This revelation in both the main story and her social link make her one of the strongest and most mature characters in the game, despite her initial dissatisfaction with who she is. In the end, it's not the problems themselves that help me remember who these characters are. I remember them fondly because of how I'm able to help them through those problems. I remembered them because of the time I spent talking to them. The things we did together, and the things they said, and the jokes they'd crack. They felt like a real group of social outcasts that all banded together over their common interests, problems, and goals. It didn't matter what they were going through or who they were on the inside, what mattered was that they felt genuine. They felt realistic. They were all just goofy kids that kept each other company. And of course, the countless moments that exist solely for the sake of being fun diversions from the stress of the game's main plot help solidify them as a pack of misfits that I'll never forget. I don't think any cast of characters in an RPG will ever come close to feeling as fleshed out and as real to me as Persona 4's main cast. And yes, that goes for you too, Teddy. A bear's chastity. True love needs a sacrifice. Just for you, Sensei. Teddy. That's it, I quit. This just ain't my thing. To hell with the exams. It's time for my animal practice. Dude, what is that? What's what? Your swimsuit, what else would I mean? It's your basic black, but... Give me your heart. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to be born, damn it. So now that all of that's out of the way, it's time for the real meat and potatoes of the social link discussion that I'm sure some of you have been waiting for. In 2015, I played Fire Emblem Awakening for the first time, and I discovered the joy of support conversations. Just like social links here, they allowed you to connect further with your party members and enhance their abilities in combat. But what I looked forward to most was coming across that one special party member that I'd fall in love with. I didn't know who it was going to be, but I was excited to find out. Now in order to execute something like this gracefully, you need to have characters that could potentially pique the romantic interests of the player. You don't want it to feel shallow or ham-fisted. You want to write it as if it could happen organically like this in reality. Even though it won't, sorry bud. Luckily, Persona 4 has some of the best video game writing I have ever seen, and needless to say, I kinda like these characters. So, <clears throat> without further ado, who did Liam romance? In contrast to Fire Emblem Awakening, your amount of time to level up your social links is pretty strict. That's the whole point. Since the game is a huge balancing act, if you're good enough at it, you could feasibly pack each day with meaningful activities. I needed to figure out who this special person was, and fast. Because of this, there was no way in hell I was going to romance Naoto on my first playthrough. There just wasn't enough time for me to tackle her social link to the fullest extent. And that sucks because her social link is awesome and I totally recommend maxing it out. On top of that, you can't date any of the guys. So for example, if you took an interest in and identified with Kanji due to his struggles with sexual orientation, there's no option to take that any further. If you saw Yosuke as more than just a best friend, too bad. He actually almost became an option, and it would have contextualized his terrible attitude towards Kanji at times. Considering how much self-projection you're doing throughout the series, I'd like to see them take that route someday, outside of Persona 2. Anyway, since I joined the drama club on my first playthrough, that also excludes Ayane, leaving us with Yumi Ozawa, Ai Abihara, Risei, Chie, Yukiko, and Marie. Let's eliminate them one by one. Ai's social link is handled quite well. If you aren't willing to listen to her and you get to know her, she'll reject your romantic advances later down the line. But if you play your cards right, she'll eventually learn to have some respect for others while maintaining her aggressive, flirtatious habits. It's an intriguing dynamic and a worthwhile social link. However, she was too much for me. You know who else was too much for me? Yumi. Holy shit. Her behavior is understandable, but she is a handful. It was difficult for me to make a proper connection with her with the constant squabbling going on. My character is just like a sponge soaking up everything that she says, and then squeezing out some generic lines that kind of help her out in the moment. Now, I'm about to say something pretty controversial here. Like, this might rustle some jimmies. I am indifferent to Marie. I know, I know, I know. 
Now, her social link is pretty substantial and entertaining, and it leads to an optional boss fight at the end of the game. Since she is exclusive to Golden, it kind of makes sense that they were able to commit a decent amount of time to it. But I, I find her attitude funky, and the constant poetry went from being slightly endearing and humorous to, come on, I just want to fuse my personas, come on! With that said, I understand why people like her. I might have had a low tolerance for her mannerisms, but I totally see the appeal. So we're down to Risei, Yukiko, and Shie. I considered each of them at some point. They're all great characters with wonderful social links. Yukiko's strides in gaining confidence and independence, Risei's unraveling of her fabricated identity and discovering who she really is, and Shie's subtle nerdiness and desire to protect people close to her all made for fantastic and believable dynamics. All three made a lot of sense to me. But in the end, I only chose one. I didn't date everyone at once like a degenerate. Yeah, that's right, you know who you are. In the end, I chose... Drumroll, please. That's right, although the game made it really difficult to turn Risei down, like unbearably difficult, I ended up going with Miss Satanaka in the end. I found her dynamic personality super adorable. Something about the way she'd seem all badass and over the top while still having this cute and sensitive core that she eventually embraces just clicked with me. Aaron Fitzgerald also played a great part in Chie winning me over. I was not expecting her shy romantic side to sound so convincing, and she did a great job selling that. Even her idol animations in battle were really fun to watch. You know how Yosuke puts on his headphones and just jams out while he fights? Chie bounces around all full of energy, and she roundhouse kicks to awaken her persona. She's a great character. Also, I was very pleased to find out that no matter who you choose to date, you'll have a few events with them before you head back home. On Christmas Eve, you'll share a romantic evening together. Well, you also technically spend Christmas Day together, if you know what I'm saying. On New Year's Day, you'll draw fortunes at the shrine and accept that distance won't matter if you truly love each other. On the ski trip, you'll get lost and find warmth in a nearby cabin. Among other things. And on Valentine's Day, she makes you chocolates. Sorry, she tries to make you chocolates, but the notion is lovely. And then, you head home. Wait, aren't I forgetting something? Oh, right. Yeah, Nanako's been kidnapped. Sorry, I just wanted to see if you guys were paying attention. Uh, our heroes haven't found the truth just yet. Before this happened, I made sure to max out her social link. As I touched upon earlier, she lives a very hard life for a seven-year-old. But I learned from her social link that she really misses her mom. The constant loneliness she lives in is devastating to witness. But as you level up her social link, she gradually becomes more comfortable around you, as if you're her big brother. She welcomes you home with joy every day. But even still, her life is as mundane as ever. I did what I could, but that won't bring her mom back or stop Dojima from working day and night, leaving Nanako alone. Dojima's social link also helps him come to grips with the loss of his wife, and allows him to connect with his daughter more, and I enjoyed bringing us closer together. But as this came to be, I grew more and more worried about betraying his trust. I was investigating the murders, and at some point, he was gonna find out about my involvement with the case, and I dreaded that day. One evening, I'm spending some time with Nanako watching the news. Someone interviewed children at a local elementary school about the anxieties they have over the fog and murders happening in their town. One young girl, they said, was very eager to speak her own mind. Just after they said that, Nanako caught a cold. My heart stopped for a second when I realized what was about to happen. Not only had I received some strange mail leading up to this point, foreshadowing this exact moment, but the timing on this was just unbearable. Heedless of those warnings, the game continues like normal for a few days after this. I don't know why, but of course, the only thing on my mind at this point is Nanako. On the 5th of November, Dojima handed me a letter he found in the mail. The contents of this letter ended up completely betraying his trust, and he took me into the station for questioning. While this is happening, Yosuke calls Nanako to see if I'm home, and I'm not. She informs him of what's going on, and here's where things take an even worse turn. Nanako appears on the Midnight Channel, and at this point everyone is scrambling to stop the kidnapper, who ends up being Taro Namatame, the man who had an affair with Mayumi Yamano at the beginning of the game. Dojima crashes into him, and he ends up in the hospital gravely injured. It's now the investigation team's responsibility to save Nanako. Her dungeon is simply called Heaven and it's not about her pursuing her true self. All Nanako really wants is to see her mother again.
You'd better believe I blitzed this dungeon. How could you not? I'll have time for my social links afterwards. Right now, I have to save Nanako at any cost. When you finally reach Namatame, he begins to blabber about how he's saving people when he puts them in the TV world. It's all bullshit. Right? He's totally the culprit. Right? Dojima's wrong. I'm... I'm happy with my choices. R right? What played over the credits was this eerie, unsatisfactory piece. As if something is missing. It disturbed me to see things end this way. No. Something definitely wasn't right here. In fact, Dojima mentioned Namatame having a solid alibi at the very beginning of the game. Maybe he really was telling the truth back there. Perhaps we should listen. What follows are some of the greatest moments I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing in a video game. Namatame spills the beans, and reveals that his intentions were indeed pure. After this, the trail seems to run cold. You're once again asked to gather as much information as possible to conclusively nail down a suspect, while Inaba is shrouded in a thick, green fog. The atmosphere in Inaba feels hopeless, as if doom is drawing near. Later that night, at Aya, you step outside with Yosuke and Naoto to think things over. Yosuke mentions that he can't see the snow through the fog, symbolic of how close you really are to the truth. So let's go over the facts. Who, outwardly, had something to do with Mayumi Yamano and Saki Konishi, knew about the TV world, knew what Namatame was doing, and watched it all unfold? And how could there have been no witnesses? How could someone have delivered a note to our house without arousing suspicion? Let's see... Yosuke? <laughs> nah. Dojima? Oh, no way. Teddy? Well, I'd understand why he'd cause suspicion, and he can be a little creepy, but he's no murderer. At least, regular Teddy isn't. And he loves Nanako too much. So, let's see. Uh... Toru Adachi. Hmm... Come to think of it, he was assigned to both Mayumi and Saki, and he works directly with my uncle, so he can come over without anyone raising an eyebrow. On top of that, he did like to overtly discuss theories about the case. Perhaps it was in an effort to throw them off? None of this can be ruled out. When I went to question him before he could relocate Namatame, everything started to align. Things started to make a lot more sense. And then, he makes a slip of the tongue. What? That's ridiculous! We already know Namatame's the one who put them all in! What did you just say? His entire facade crumbles around him from here. There were clues throughout the game, but only when you are willing to pursue the truth will you figure things out for yourself. Adachi was responsible for everything. He was sick of living out in the boonies, so he decided to make things interesting. Adachi kept feeding people these theories because of his philosophy that people are happier believing what they want to believe, living with the truth given to them at face value. Which is, of course, emblematic of the game's core message and inspiring all the same. The final boss fight with Adachi and his Lovecraftian shadow Ameno Sagiri are incredible. They test everything you've learned in combat up to this point, and you have to brace yourself for the devastating almighty damage that Ameno Sagiri can cause. The only problem I really have with this boss is that it can severely punish players that may be lagging behind in levels. Whereas strategy was always the triumphant factor beforehand, no matter your level. It forced me to grind up quite a bit. Although, this was really the only time I needed to do so throughout my entire playthrough, and I'd made it this far, so I made sure that I was ready for anything. Usually I hate grinding under any circumstances, but this made the build-up to the boss even more exciting. I mean, I may have been binging this game, but imagine people that played it slowly over the course of like a month. The impact that this boss would have on them? I can't imagine. And it already hit me pretty hard. Anyway, I finally beat him, and the case comes to a close. Adachi fesses up, you enjoy some time with your friends, say your heartfelt goodbyes, and then finally depart from Inaba. And that's Persona 4. Right? Well, there's still one question left to be answered. Where did the Midnight Channel come from? I mean, in the pursuit of truth, surely we can't leave that behind, right? I had the power to enter the TV before I had awakened my persona. Where did that come from? Supposedly, Adachi and Namatame had heard about the Midnight Channel from someone as soon as they had entered Inaba. 
who did I talk to aside from Dojima and Nanako? Then, Nanako said this. Hey, big bro. On the first day, didn't we stop at that place? Wait, what? <laughs> this blew my fucking mind. I thought I was done. I had just gone through this emotional final bout with my friends, and all of a sudden, I knew there was still work to be done. The range of emotions I was experiencing here, man. Desire for closure, not wanting to leave Inaba behind, sadness, determination, excitement, and pain. I confronted the gas station attendant, and yeah, they were the conductor behind the game's events. This pale-ass loser ended up being the goddess Izanami no Okami, and that strange dream I had at the beginning of the game ended up being the final dungeon in disguise, with Izanami tapping into my psyche. As you wander the halls of this dungeon with your friends, that piano piece from earlier comes back. It really hit me here that this was the end of my journey with Persona 4. I wouldn't be able to experience this game for the first time ever again, and I should savor this finale. I didn't want to fight the boss and see that anime sequence where everyone encouraged me to keep going. I didn't want to say goodbye to my friends. I didn't want to think about what things would be like without this game to accompany me through this rough patch we're all going through. Man, art is powerful. I've gone through this time and time again with games that I love and experiences that I cherish. Everything in life has to end, but it never gets any easier to accept that. As cheesy and stupid and preachy as it was, when the gang started running after the train, I lost it. There probably won't be another game that makes me feel the way Persona 4 made me feel. The immediate connection I experienced with its core gameplay, the innovation I saw in its mechanical intuitiveness, the ingenious I saw in the game's boss design, and how smart I'd feel when I'd conquer them, the passion I felt in its character writing, the joy I felt when I was hanging out with the investigation team, the elation and care I felt when I'd partake in this game's sim elements, the fun I had with balancing all of the game's tasks, the dedication I felt in solving the mystery, the sadness I felt when I had to say goodbye, and last, but certainly not least, the resonance the game's soundtrack had on me. Persona 4 is, without a shadow of a doubt, <laughs> see what I did there, my favorite RPG of all time, and one of my favorite video games full stop. Playing this game distracted me from our terrible reality, if even for a moment, but it also reminded me of what I could do to change things. What we can all do to change things, both in our world and within ourselves. It all starts with you. Yup, no other game would make me feel this way. But that didn't stop me from looking. I've been waiting for this. Man, I love that riff so much. It's funny, really. I had just finished Persona 4, which among many other valuable lessons, also preached that nothing lasts forever. And here I am, watching an intro video that tells me in several different languages that I am going to die. Immediately I understood what Persona 3's message was going to be, and that it was going to be a much darker game as a result. And my first impression only grew stronger. The title screen was poignantly somber, and the first cutscene was incredible. The editing was in a state of complete disarray, and the music grew louder and louder. This young girl had a gun to her head in her room, and this endless noise was being drowned out by the song Burn My Dread, which lyrically alludes to stifling your fear of death. In the end, she can't do whatever she was about to do, and the gun clatters to the floor. Needless to say, I was more than a little concerned for this girl, whoever she was. As I come to learn, her name is Yukari Takaba, and along with Mitsuru Kirijo, they work together as an organization called Seize. They investigate monsters that appear during the dark hour which shows up after midnight. Once you summon the courage to face your demise, you can summon your persona. To symbolize that, you shoot yourself in the head. Every single time. Honestly, as hilarious as that sounds, it's awesome. And once I realized that was what she was trying to do, Yukari's situation really intrigued me. I really like how despite her circumstances with her parents and her troubled life, she gradually builds up her strength over the course of the game. Aside from Yukari, however, it took a while for the plot and characters to really settle in with me. I didn't make a solid connection with most of the characters for a long time. I mean, I guess I liked how goofy Junpei could be, and Akihiko's mysterious personality ended up interesting me. But this wasn't Persona 4. 
I don't think the game wanted to force you into anything. They give you a task, and they ask you to tackle it at your own pace. Kill the shadows, clear out Tartarus, and make the Dark Hour disappear. And our protagonist this time is pretty cold and apathetic. The amount of times the game allows you to say I don't care to a character is staggering. You're supposed to feel kind of lost once you move to Iwatodai so that when you start school, it's up to you to decide how you want to spend your time. After all, you are mortal. And if life doesn't last forever, you'd better figure out how you want to spend your days. Feeling a bit ostracized when starting Persona 3 proved to be a healthy decision. As I went out of my way to find things to do day by day, I would slowly find myself balancing more and more tasks. I had more people to hang out with, more Personas to level up, and I seemed to settle into Iwatodai on my own terms. It's a pretty organic way of accustoming the player to their surroundings and the game's social elements. It's like real life, you know? When I started high school, I had no idea how I was going to get by socially. My friends from elementary school were in different corners and different classes and different social circles. The only way I was going to get anywhere was to get out of my comfort zone and do things I wouldn't usually do. I signed up for drama and home ec, made some new friends, even had some of my first romantic experiences. Persona is at its best when it mirrors reality. And I can't really say I've played a game that mirrors bursting out of that introverted bubble, quite like Persona 3. But what are the social links this time, and how are they handled? Well, things are a little less concrete than Persona 4, seeing as this was the first time they were implemented. But I also really like some of the things they've done. If you don't hang out with some of your friends long enough, or you blow them off consistently, their social links will reverse and won't become available again until you mend ties. Now, I understand why this didn't happen very frequently in future Persona games, but I find this quite fascinating. As I've said before, I love sim games. I love being punished or rewarded for my actions depending on the circumstances. This introduced a very real punishment should I neglect aspects of my social life. I'd have to take a day out of my schedule to correct my one mistake, losing precious time that I could be using to level up other social links that I need to attend to. Certain social links can only be obtained if you expand your social network, and they have their own unique effects on your playthrough. For example, Yuko Nishiwaki's social link is only accessible if you keep attending the sports club, and Chihiro only opens up to you if you keep attending student castle. If I become close to another girl while I'm hanging out with Chihiro, she gets jealous. And we're not even dating at that point, it's just part of her personality. I think this happens with at least one or two other social links, and I find it to be a neat touch. Your female party members all have social links, but they can only be approached after you max out academics for Mitsuru, courage for Fuka, and charm for Yukari. You also don't have near as many opportunities to work on those stats as you do in Persona 4, and this is why the game's balancing act is so tense in comparison. I had to think carefully about who I was going to visit and when. Meanwhile, this was all taking place while I needed to explore Tartarus during the dark hour, so I essentially only have room for one activity on those days. There is a pretty jarring issue with some of these social links, however. Some of the characters are... uh... questionable. Kenji is obnoxious. Of course dating a teacher is a bad idea, you loser. Yuko is overbearing and hard to stomach. Hidetoshi is a tool. The Gourmet King is... well, the Gourmet King. And... guys? Guys. I don't like Fuka. She's not as bad as the other characters I've mentioned, obviously, but she doesn't really do anything in the main plot. I mean, I guess her mannerisms can be kind of cute, but she's as bland as a piece of cardboard to me otherwise. Yeah, throw me in the Fuka hater pile, I'm sorry. Thankfully, there are a few characters that stood out to me. The lovely elderly couple at the bookstore were always a treat to visit, and the story about their son was touching. Bebe is super entertaining, and I wanted to help him as he grieved his beloved aunt. Maiko is precious, and her being caught in the middle of her parents' divorce is hard to ignore. And holy crap, the online game's social link was a ton of fun to watch unfold. The corny 2000s online chatting is my kind of vibe, but what makes it exciting was finding out who this character actually was. But my favorite social links were the ones for Elizabeth and Chihiro. Elizabeth's shenanigans are really funny. Something about her emptying an endless wallet into the fountain made me die of laughter the first time I saw it. And I really enjoyed helping Chihiro come out of her shell. Now, with all of this at hand, there's just one question left. <clears throat> Who did Leon romance Chihiro? And it wasn't even close. She's my type? Always has been. I thought about Yukari due to how attached I was to her circumstances, and that moment on the beach was pretty sweet, but I fell for Chihiro pretty much as soon as I met her. Anyway, remember that all of this is taking place alongside your ventures into Tartarus, and coping with a previous game's gameplay is probably what interested and scared me most about Persona 3. Tartarus is a 264-story procedurally generated tower that you eventually have to scale in its entirety. 
You can proceed at your own pace, but you don't want to be lagging behind as the game increases in difficulty. Those big shadows will keep coming once a month, and it's important that you're prepared. The balance between Tartarus, my social links, and the occasional plot events made most of my Persona 3 playthrough relatively relaxing. I mean, they still challenge you with bosses on certain floors, but for the most part, the challenge comes from the balance you have to strike. Challenge can also come from how long your run lasts in a night. See, Persona 3 has a fatigue system. If you stay in Tartarus long enough, your party members will have to drop out due to exhaustion. As you proceed, you need to constantly gauge risks. How many enemies should you fight? How far should you go? Should you seek out one of the progress saving warp points? Or should you cut your losses and retreat for the time being? It's a fantastic system, and it makes what would otherwise be a repetitive trek through an ever-changing labyrinth that much more intense. I also love that as you ascend, the music slowly gains more instrumentation and new melodies. It goes from being this uncertain, moody piece, to a hopeful piano drowning out any fear, evocative and symbolic of the game's thesis. Although with that said, Tartarus does overstay its welcome after a while. Once you get into a proper rhythm, fatigue becomes a non-issue. You could easily blitz half a block of Tartarus in one night after a certain point, if not an entire block. And anytime you warp back to the entrance, your entire party's HP and SP are both restored. I got sick of Tartarus by the time October came around, and no amount of enemy variety could fix the monotony. It's a good thing the game's actual combat remained consistently excellent. I love it for the same reasons I love Persona 4's combat, so there isn't much I need to reiterate. There are a few substantial differences, however. There are three types of physical damage now, and the weapon you choose in combat could be crucial in knocking an enemy down. Because of this, I like to sort my party based on weapon types. Elemental weaknesses were pretty easy for me to manage based on intelligent fusions, but physical weaknesses? I'd need some help. A less than desirable difference, however, you can't directly control your party members. Every other RPG I've played lets you do this, but Persona 3 doesn't. You can influence their actions with the tactics menu, but that's it. Usually this is enough. The AI will make competent decisions that keep you alive. However, sometimes that isn't the case and they'll make questionable decisions, like whacking the same enemy they just knocked down when they could instead very easily go for a sweep. Even if you set them to target weaknesses, they'll still do this sometimes. And on top of that, there are things they do that are based on developer oversights. So, here's a scenario for you. In this game, when you analyze an enemy, you'll learn their strengths, weaknesses, and moveset. However, you have to figure out a boss's weaknesses on your own. With that said, if you analyze a boss enemy, your party members will secretly be made aware of the boss's abilities. Because Hulk Hogan over here secretly had a counter, I guess was stuck in a wait loop and rendered useless. I had no idea why this was happening, and it resulted in my premature demise. I only found this out because I looked up his weakness on the Mega 10 wiki. By the way, maybe this is hindsight talking, but why the hell is waiting a command? It is a complete waste of a turn. If you're playing Persona 3 Portable, none of this is a problem because you can control your party members. But I wanted to experience this game in its raw, unaltered form first. I wanted to suffer like many others did back in the day. From here on out though, I'm going to be playing Portable, no question. Even if it lacks FMVs and the hubs can't be explored and taken in. Also, Persona 3 Portable lets you play as a female protagonist, and it's phenomenal! The way characters interact with her differs slightly from the male protagonist's run, and I think it's a nice touch. As unfair as it is, your gender will affect how people see you, and her desire to break free from this notion is represented in her battle theme. Yeah, the music of Persona 3 is just generally really damn good. It features banger after banger. It primarily zeroes in on a hip-hop vibe, and it's some of the finest I've heard from a Japanese musician. Everything I do in this game is immediately heightened, no matter what it is. It's like I have an iPod on me as I walk around. In fact, that's exactly what's happening. The protagonist always has his MP3 player on him, and he's got some great taste. And the battle theme is... Well, I'm sure it needs no introduction. Perfect for the tone of the game, and it only gets better with every listen. Things only ramped up in quality with Persona 3, and the characters that had a slow start began to blossom. The Kirijo group were responsible for the Dark Hour, and this is something that hangs over Mitsuru's head throughout the game. Junpei falls for one of the anime gang's members, Chirori, due to her drawings and his desire to have a true connection with someone. The way he shows genuine concern for her is one of the most endearing things about his character. Aegis seeks to remember why she seems destined to protect me, and she fights to regain her purpose in life. And Shinjiro's refusal to rejoin Seas remains a consistent mystery. 
Things come to a head, however, when Ken finds out that Shinji was the one who killed his mother. Accident or not, he threatens to kill Shinji. That is, until this evil son of a bitch shows up. Takei is like one of the biggest assholes I have ever seen. He is the antithesis of what this game stands for. He accepts that time delivers all equally to the same end, but he doesn't value human life nearly as much. And to prove this, he dismisses people like he's shooting fish in a barrel. Although Shinji goes out protecting Ken, he dies for nothing. You can feel the extraordinary amount of turmoil Ken must be feeling in this moment. Shinji's death shakes the entire narrative, and my perception of these characters shifted in an instant. I was reminded of the game's thesis in the grimmest of fashions. And he was my best party member too! He was obliterating people with his physical skills, and I loaded him up with my best equipment. But that's the thing. With moments like these, I learned to cherish the goofy time I spent with my characters. The Metal Gear Solid moment in the hot spring, the last full moon being conquered, Christmas Eve with my significant other, because I knew that tragedy was always going to be around the corner. I knew death was imminent, both for the people I cared about, and for me. The Junpei and Chidori relationship ended up compelling me quite a bit. It was exactly what his character needed, and Chidori's change of heart ended up aligning with the game's themes thus far. She was afraid to become attached to anything, or anyone. They're both scared to be alone for very different reasons, and the relationship is beautiful. Now, remember when I said my heart skipped a beat with Nanako? Yeah, I, I think my heart fucking stopped when this happened. Junpei had shown exponential growth over the course of the game, and he slowly became one of my favorite characters. And at the apex of his development, he is murdered by Takaya. Of course, Chidori revives him with her persona, but that doesn't make this moment any easier to stomach. I wanted to see these two flourish together, but just as the game has taught me, life can pull the rug out from under you any time. Junpei learns a lot from this, and he becomes dead set on ending the Dark Hour. Oh yeah, uh, Ikutsuki was lying about the Dark Hour, and now we have to deal with the fact that he assisted in awakening a deity named Nyx, who will bring about the end of humanity. At the same time, that mysterious young boy becomes Ryoji, a shadow of death. An odd gentleman with a somber ultimatum. Kill him, lose all memory of the Dark Hour and Tartarus and live in blissful ignorance until you cease to exist, or attempt to fight Nyx, against all odds. Even Igis couldn't beat Nyx, and she feels like she is rendered useless. On New Year's Eve, you are forced to make this decision. Do you take the easy way out, or do you burn your dread? I will. The final boss fights with Takaya and Nyx are amazing, especially Nyx. The Nyx avatar cycles through every arcana, and you constantly have to figure out what would be effective against it. It can get extremely tense, but after ascending Tartarus and coming this far, death is merely an inconvenience. Let me preface my final thoughts with something. I am really glad I didn't enter the series with Persona 3. Its battle system has its quirks, Tartarus gets boring, and the game's plot and characters develop very slowly. These would have turned me away from the game in due time, despite knowing that I would have loved the simulation elements. However, being accustomed to the series through Persona 4 meant that I could appreciate it a great deal. I took my time with it, and eventually, I became invested in its message, its nuanced writing, its gameplay, and its characters. It does things that still remain unique to the series, and its characters all deal with dread, grievances, and death in different ways. It's a fascinating and, ultimately, very enjoyable game, despite its flaws, and it maintains an atmosphere unique to Persona and video games as a whole. After finishing Persona 3, I was a little less afraid of the uncontrollable and unexplained events in my life. So, I had then finished two Persona games. I was in love with the series. I had caught the Persona virus, and I couldn't wait to play more. And after three long years of persistent and frankly, aggressive recommendations, I knew exactly what to play next. Wake up, get up, get up there. This isn't the first time I'd seen this game's intro. Something this stylish and full of energy doesn't pass me by when it's already been seen by millions of people around the world. Much like Persona 3 and 4 before it, the lyrics and the music present the game's message pretty clearly. And oh boy, Persona 5 is not going for subtlety. There are a ton of gratuitous visual metaphors throughout the game that really hammer in its message of rising up against corrupt adults. 
Persona 5's dungeons are palaces that represent a person's twisted desires. So in contrast to Persona 4, the leaders of these palaces fully embrace their desires. To symbolize Kamoshida's domination over the school students, they depict him as the king of his own castle. To demonstrate the physical abuse and how he has the students imprisoned in Shujin Academy, they have them restrained and being literally pummeled by sports balls in his dungeon. This kanji, by the way, means prisoner, and it can be read as Shujin. Yeah, that blatant enough for you. To represent Madorame taking advantage of his pupils, every single piece of art is gorgeous yet distinct, abstract and dissonant, and yet none of it is his. Kaneshiro is a gluttonous Yakuza member that owns a massive bank, and he views people as literal ATMs for him to drain money from. Every single dungeon knocks this shit out of the park. There are a couple of specific visual metaphors in this game that stick out to me most, but by that point the story is getting pretty beefy so it'd be best to wait. But in general, it's phenomenal stuff. Persona 5's presentation is astounding, as you'd expect from a 9 year gap between games. And when talking about presentation, you can't ignore this game's UI. This was one of the first things to strike me back when the game first came out, and holy shit, I am not kidding when I say that interacting with the menus is so fun that it feels like its own game. It's all snappy, punky, rebellious, and it makes something as simple as receiving text messages feel like an event. Considering this game can be upwards of 80 hours long, it's quite an accomplishment to create a user interface that is always a pleasure to mess with. When you visit some of the shops, the menus are so defined that they feel like they're from an entirely different game. Iwai runs the airsoft shop, and his menus have this militaristic vibe that immediately demonstrates what his character is like if you pursue his social link. Rough exterior, but soft and caring on the inside. We'll talk more about him later, but just keep him in mind for now. I also love how each menu uses a 3D model of the character in question, but it's so heavily stylized that you can't even tell. All of this stuff is so slick. I know most of what I'm saying isn't exactly new, most people have already heaped loads of praise on this game's presentation, but it's just fun to gush about something that I missed out on for so long. I'm here with you now. As you can tell, the game's story and overall vibe are both heavily influenced by picaresque fiction. It's like a modern Don Quixote, and I have a feeling that as long as there's corruption in this world, it'll always be relevant. Whether we're talking about an abusive teacher at a school in the middle of nowhere, or a major world leader. The way you climb the ranks throughout the narrative and make a name for yourself is liberating. Although, let's step back a bit. Before I get ahead of myself, allow me to walk you through my first impression of Persona 5. For starters, the game's tutorial is easily one of the best I've seen in an RPG. It's flashy, engaging, informative, and it doesn't overstay its welcome in the slightest. Crucial surface level information about the gameplay is communicated in such a short time frame, the stealth and dungeon crawling concepts are instantly enticing, and the music is badass. I'm captured by the police, and I'm immediately wondering how I got myself into this situation. And then, we rewind back to April. I'm on probation for helping a lady that was being assaulted. Everywhere I go and everyone I meet treats me like a criminal. Even my guardian Sojiro Sakura, despite being a so-called friend of my parents, thinks I'm nothing but trouble. Life just ain't fair. Because of this, I end up leaning on dialogue choices that make me seem sort of defiant. Usually I try to restrain myself, but with such a thick atmosphere of repression and predisposed bias towards me, I don't feel like holding back. Respect is a two-way street, and if your words and actions haven't earned mine, why should I reciprocate? I realize, however, that Sojiro is different. When I tidy up my room, I get a glimpse of respect out of him. When I behave myself, clean the restaurant, or make some coffee for him, I gradually gain his trust, and he opens up to me little by little. Getting to the damn restaurant proved to be a challenge in and of itself, as did getting to school. I found myself asking for directions while I perused that back alley, and I desperately monitored the signs as I tried to transfer to the Ginza line. It's quite realistic, and it fits right in with the theme of feeling like you're not welcome. It reminds me of what Persona 3 went for in the beginning, organically presented here within a fixed and intelligently implemented structure, and the music is perfect for it. Thankfully, this wasn't going to last forever. Vulgar Boy and I stumble upon Kamoshida's castle, and the ball starts rolling. From here, you befriend Ryuji Sakamoto and on to Kamaki, and after they stand up for themselves and their friends in the face of Kamoshida's abuse, they vow to change his heart by stealing his distorted desires. Now before we get into the meat of this game's story, characters, and confidants, as they're called in this game, which is a nice touch, I need to talk about what makes the gameplay of this game special. I am so glad I played the other two games first, because the quality of life changes and new mechanics make it such a streamlined RPG. 
Most of the combat remains relatively familiar, however there are certain new additions and gimmicks that keep things consistently entertaining. First of all, each of your actions are now mapped to buttons. It's so simple and it keeps things moving when you have your strategy down pat. Second, characters can now use guns. Usually I save these for exploiting weaknesses, but certain characters and personas can learn powerful gun abilities like Haru. She balanced psychic, gun, and support abilities and she became vital to my setup. Oh yeah, there are also two new types of magic, Nuke and Psy, and Light and Dark have been reworked as Bless and Curse, allowing for even more possibilities in battle. Because of all the type differences, it's on you to maintain a healthy lineup of personas. Also, inactive party members can finally level up on their own, meaning that if you need to swap in Ryuji for his raw strength or On for her devastating fire attacks, you can do that without feeling like you're carrying dead weight or doing unnecessary grinding. Gathering new personas in this game also lifts the negotiation system for Megaten, and I had no idea this even existed at the time. You're telling me that there are sim elements in battle now and it's crucial to learn this stuff? Oh man, I had so much fun with this. Trying to figure out which dialogue options it would appreciate in order to lure them in, or get an item out of them? If this had been in Megami Tensei for a while, then I'm missing out. But perhaps the most substantial new addition to combat is the baton pass mechanic. The combat essentially revolves around this. Once you hit an enemy's weakness, you'll have the option to pass things off to one of your party members. If they hit another enemy's weakness, the cycle continues until you've run out of members to switch off of. And with every baton pass comes more power. And once the baton pass ends, you'll still have your regular turns to get back to, meaning that you can initiate another baton pass. Getting sweeps in regular battles is a lot easier because of this, like maybe a little too easy in some cases, but it can be a ton of fun when dealing with bosses. The fight with Shadow Matarame asks you to have a wide variety of abilities to choose from, and strategize based on who should be receiving the baton pass. There are a lot of openings in your party because they have access to quite a few elements, so you'd best knock them down as soon as possible. You can also get a baton pass out of a technical, which means attacking in accordance with an enemy's status effect. It's an incredible system, and utilizing it effectively meant that I could brace myself for a boss's most powerful attacks. It adds an entirely new layer of depth to every battle. Speaking of bosses, I appreciate how the most detestable villains all have someone else do their bidding for them or attack in symbolic ways. We saw this with Madarame's clones and paintings, but Kaneshiro locks himself inside of a giant piggy bank and has his minions fight for him. Meanwhile, his attacks just flaunt money at you. Okumura uses robots to do his bidding, a commentary on how his employees are treated, and you have to cut through them all reluctantly. When you land just a single blow on him, he's done for. There are a few more bosses I want to talk about, but I'll save them for later. I think this game might have the best turn-based combat I've seen in a traditional JRPG. I was having fun right up to the credits. Perhaps it's because of 30 years of evolution, or my lack of experience with the genre, but I can't wait to see what might eventually top it if such a game even exists. The dungeons in this game are unrecognizable in the face of Persona 3 and 4, but I believe they've been revamped for the better. Every single dungeon in this game is beautifully constructed. It feels like they hired Zelda designers just for these portions of the game. Yeah, in yet another way Persona specifically targets me. I feel called out. There are overlapping sections with keys to different areas, puzzles galore that also pertain to the villain's ideals, and stealth plays a part in choosing who you want to fight and when. Kamoshida's Palace is a nice first dungeon that eases you into possible ideas for challenges, but things really ramp up in creativity and fun with Madarame's museum. Tons of abstract and scalable art, spotting the differences in Sayuri as you traverse a twisted labyrinth, and navigating a maze of paintings. And this is in conjunction with everything else it does well as a dungeon. Kaneshiro has you performing a heist across the bank, and once you reach the vault, you need to decipher codes that pertain to his greed. Each dungeon's gimmick makes sense in the context of the narrative, and they keep the gameplay fresh. I was in love with the game by this point, but things were about to get even better. During the summer, the Phantom Thieves are contacted by the mysterious Alibaba, who turns out to be Futaba Sakura, adopted daughter of Sojiro. She became a shut-in after her mother's death, and after family read her suicide note, they continually blamed Futaba for her death. She already lived in isolation due to her high intelligence and other habits, but as her mother worked long hours to support her, her feelings of guilt over being the cause of their strained relationship began to grow. This combination of abuse, isolation, and guilty thoughts led to her developing social anxiety and agoraphobia, and she desperately wishes for the Phantom Thieves to change her heart. She hates herself, and it's heartbreaking to see her go through this. The dungeon itself has puzzles that reflect Futaba's eidetic memory, and it's freaking brilliant. In the end, it's revealed that her mother's suicide note was forged, and she never stopped loving Futaba. 
Her research into cognitive science was sabotaged and Futaba was forced to take the brunt of everything. All of this makes the dungeon unique and one I'll never forget. Her confidant interactions have you helping her bust out of the bubble that she's been forced into, and it was touching to watch it all unfold. She's a charismatic girl and working towards getting her back into a traditional way of life made me feel all warm and fuzzy. Futaba is easily my favorite character in the game, not just because of everything she goes through, but also because it was very easy for me to put myself in her shoes. I went through very similar struggles with social anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder in high school, and had this game been released back then, and had I played it, my time there might have been a lot different. Persona 5 had its moments that reminded me of why I fell in love with Persona 4's characters. Everyone seems to have their own immediately resonant problems. Makoto's inferiority complex and feeling like a burden to her sister got me reasonably empathetic. Madarame painted over Yusuke's mother's self-portrait and claimed fabricated ownership over it, and I was furious at him for it. But these characters' merits don't end at the hardships they face, much like Hashino's previous works. Yusuke's character may be an archetype I've seen already, but that didn't stop me from loving him and wanting him to pursue his artistic career. He's charming in his own stupid way. That sentence definitely applies to Ryuji as well, he's kind of like a vulgar, angry Yosuke. Ahn's peppy, but easygoing at her core. She felt like a best friend, and it pained me to see her deal with Shiho's suicide attempt. The only character I don't like is Morgana. He's obnoxious. He simps for Ahn, forces you to go to bed, and throws a temper tantrum out of jealousy before immediately rejoining the group as if nothing had ever happened. I mean, come on, Morgana. There are more pressing matters at hand. Haru is being forced into an arranged marriage, and Okumura is treating people like slaves. Can you shut your mouth for once? He is unquestionably a second attempt at a mascot character, but the difference being Teddy actually has a decent character arc throughout the game, and he's hilarious. Anyway, how are the confidants this time? Well, I was excited to visit a few of them, at least. Remember Iwai? Well, his brother has been forcing him to customize real guns under the table at his airsoft shop. On top of that, he's protective over his son, who he can't talk to about his ties to the Yakuza. Who'd have thought that such a tough guy would end up being one of the kindest and most caring confidants in the game? And as you level him up, he'll open up to you as you browse for guns and modifications. He's a great confidant. This time around, all of your friends can gain substantial abilities, not just your party members. One of my favorite confidants is Miss Kawakami, your homeroom teacher. She works part-time as a maid to pay the guardians of a previous student of hers. It's a strange and borderline predatory dynamic, but you obviously don't have to take the romance route with her, and the game treats that stuff as a joke. Uh, sort of. She can also save you the trouble of spending your evenings by washing your laundry in order to gain more armor, or cooking to gain SP restoration items as she levels up. Some of the confidants, like Kawakami, require you to change the hearts of those that are harassing them. And if you care enough about said confidants, like I did, it's a breeze to factor them into your schedule. I also really liked helping Takemi as she aimed to clear her name and save her patients' lives. There's more to every confidant that meets the eye, and it turns the game's feeling of oppressiveness upside down. And even if you're indifferent to some of them, they do gain some pretty awesome abilities, so it's worth it. And now... <clears throat> For the last time, who did Liam romance? Shopping is always so fun. It's a great stress reliever. Combat must be my method of stress relief. Haru ended up being my favorite of the bunch. As awesome as I thought Futaba was, the game treats her like she's your sister and it'd feel weird dating her. Despite everything that's happened to her, her father's death, a relationship that's been forced on her, and businessmen trying to usurp her power after she takes over Okumura Foods, she maintains this outward calmness and a strong image. I admired her for that. In the face of everything, regardless of how much pain she might be going through, she goes about her days like normal, tending to her garden, fighting alongside the phantom thieves, and smiling all the same. She inspired me. She also has this weird yet humorous side to her, and I just kind of fell head over heels for her character as a whole. And after my fake love confession to get her out of that awkward situation at the school festival, it just felt right to pursue a relationship with her. Oh yeah, uh, her father didn't just die. He was assassinated. The palaces that reflect everyone's hearts are part of a collective world known as the Metaverse. And there's this evil Persona user that's been going around and causing mental shutdowns. By the way, here's a fun and very irresponsible drinking game. Take a shot every time someone says mental shutdown, because you will probably die. 
After Okumura is killed, the timing with the Phantom Thieves' infiltration seems too convenient. The odds tip in Detective Goto Akechi's favor, as he was one of the first personalities to publicly denounce them. He's kinda like the group's rival throughout the game, although he acts as if he'd like to be on good terms. Throughout the game, he's constantly shown up and neglected by Makoto's sister Sae, and she has this unhealthy obsession with success. At one point, she even lashes out at Makoto for distracting her from her work. The pressure builds and builds, and she dismisses justice in pursuit of success. At this point, I figured that she was the assassin, because she'd be able to rig the cases in her favor. She could orchestrate this elaborate scheme that frames the Phantom Thieves for murder. <laughs> uh, my innocent mind yet again. Akechi joins the Phantom Thieves in an effort to unravel the conspiracy. Sae's palace is a casino in which everything is rigged in her favor. You have to tip the odds by sneaking around and neutralizing the rigging mechanisms. It's a great dungeon, and while it reflects her character brilliantly, it also gave my smooth-brained theory some more ground. In the end, you go off on your own with the treasure, you're captured and told you've been ratted out, and that brings us to the present. Now here's where things get really interesting. The side effects of the drug start to wear off and your mind becomes clearer. Suddenly, you remember something that still needs to be done. I realized it too then. It was our conversation about pancakes, right? Oh, am I mistaken? I thought I heard something about delicious pancakes. Again and again, Persona continues to blow my mind. Goro Akechi, the soft-spoken, intelligent, dapper detective that I'd grown to love and hate all the same, was indeed the true culprit behind the mental shutdowns. Although in this case, there was no one else the assassin could have been. The hints were right in front of me throughout the game. The delicious pancakes? How could he have heard Morgana? Only people that have been to the metaverse can understand him. On top of that, Akechi used the Phantom Thieves as a catalyst for his success and, the biggest giveaway, we never see him awaken his persona, and his alibi isn't very strong for how he obtained it in the first place. I am damn stupid for not thinking that was suspicious. I also never noticed this until now, but take a look at this game's all-out attack poses. They're all in line with the characters' personalities, and they're stylish as hell. But Akechi's is bland, and it's bland for a reason. He wasn't really a phantom thief, he's fabricating it all. Nice detail, but it's also a pretty big clue. Yeah, there's no one else it really could have been, and my theory about Nijima kind of fell apart by the time I'd finished her dungeon anyway. Although the drug might have seemed like a convenient plot device for the big reveal, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Your character was always supposed to stop Akechi, and it was up to you to realize that. Here's a fun Japanese lesson for you. Both Adachi and Akechi's names end in chi, and one of the kanji for chi means blood. Ake, in particular, can be written like this, and this kanji can be read as vermilion, meaning that Akechi's name can be written as vermilion blood. Yeah, those fluent in kanji probably realized this and thought Akechi was immediately suspicious. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Akechi shoots you and the game ends. Just kidding. Makoto convinces her sister's shadow to create a metaverse copy of the interrogation room. I didn't know that was possible, but okay. And although your so-called suicide is publicized, you make it out alive and go into hiding as you plan to take down the leader of the conspiracy, Masayoshi Shido. He's a corrupt politician that also kickstarted the events of the game when you stepped up to defend that lady. And he's also Akechi's father, I don't know, he disowns him after the Phantom Thieves come back. It's kind of weird that you're able to do social links that would bring attention to yourself before that, but hey, I won't bat an eye. Also, Shido may look like David Cross, but his name is pretty close to Shinzo, as in Shinzo Abe. I sense some animosity amongst the developers toward their government, and that contextualizes the overall mood of the game and its characters. The Phantom Thieves all hold some frustration towards adults that have wronged them, including Akechi. And considering this game's plot was born from frustration with how the Japanese government handled the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, I think it's poignant. Shido's cruise ship may be the longest dungeon in the game, but it's significantly fleshed out and a ton of fun to explore and solve. You'll need to ask around for clues, sneak around as a mouse in a room that changes your form, and take out each of the five main shadows. To maximize your time with your confidants, it's best that you do each dungeon in a single day, making this one in particular one hell of a challenge, but it's an undertaking that I enjoyed immensely. That and the interactions with some of these guys are great fun, like when you say you're suggesting a tattoo design for the Yakuza boss. After grabbing the fifth letter, I ran into none other than the disgraced detective Goro Akechi. Now, this is one of my favorite scenes in the game, due in large part to Akechi's English voice actor, Robbie Damon. I knew Akechi was crazy, but I didn't realize how twisted he really was until this moment. His very existence is a scandal, and to make up for it, he causes commotion for the hell of it. 
His TV show is just a facade for what he's doing. And what it all boils down to is this. You, you're just some criminal trash living in an attic. So how? How does someone like you have things I don't? How can such a worthless piece of trash be more special than me? Now, in the original Persona 5, I'd understand why this guy would come off as an aggressive, whiny loser. But in Persona 5 Royal, the version I played, Akeshi is a proper confidant that progresses via player input, which adds significant depth to his character. It turns him into this lovable rival and brings a much different context to the table in this moment. In the original, I don't know if I would have cared about killing this loser. However, because of the time we spent together, discussing his personal life, and even the skirmish you have with him in Mementos, I found myself engaged in his character development. By the way, how the fuck did I not think he was the culprit after fighting him in Mementos? Forget being smooth-brained, I must not even have a brain! Drool is leaking out of my mouth as I talk about this game right now. Anyway, that kind of build-up over the course of the game made this moment actually resonate with me, and it resonated for a few reasons. I knew Akechi only went down this path because he took a few steps that were opposite mine. And as he deteriorates further and slowly slips into madness, Robbie Damon's voice acting really kicks in. Just listen to this edgelord go off. <laughs> now, let's see you drop dead one at a time in front of your precious friends! Damn it, he's lost it! <laughs> Here comes! Die! I love this fight so much. It may just be a single opponent with a persona like yours, but that's exactly what makes it fun. And it's not just that. Akechi's battle quotes are splendid. The trash of society. Eat this! I'm not letting you off! After beating him up and giving him a good talking to, he sacrifices himself in order to let the Phantom Thieves finish their mission. Behind the bulkhead door, I remind him of the promise I made by holding onto his glove, and he presumably dies. In Persona 5, that was the end of him. Not much in the way of development, and he bites the dust. But in Royal, well, whatever, I'm sure it doesn't change much, right? The final fight with Shido turns him into Senator Armstrong, by the way. It's insane, and barely manageable. He loves his heat riser, and when he incapacitated all of my party members, I nearly shit myself. What a close call. But it's designed for you to just barely be able to come out on top. And so I did. With Ryuji's track team skills, we managed to secure a lifeboat. Now to just swing by and pick him up. Oh, come on! After changing Shido's heart, the public seems to lose all trust in him. They believe the Phantom Thieves do not exist, and now they have nothing to believe in. They're apathetic. In response, the Phantom Thieves resolve to change the public's hearts by descending Mementos. I haven't mentioned it until now, but Mementos represents the public consciousness. It's here where you go to change the hearts of people who aren't necessarily bad, but need to be reformed in some way. Mementos is a sprawling, procedurally generated dungeon in the style of Tartarus. So if you miss this stuff, it's still back and it's required. Now in the original Persona 5, this became a slog. You'd be forced to come back at least every month to stay on top of your confidants. However, in Royal, you can charge through lower level enemies to keep things moving. Memento stayed enjoyable in Royal because I was able to clear it at my own pace up until the end of the game. It's not something I entirely enjoy, I still think Persona 4's dungeons were the pinnacle of this gameplay style, but I enjoyed my time and I loved listening to the conversations between my party members, as demonstrated with Haru. At the bottom, it turns into an actual dungeon, although it isn't anything too special in the face of the other dungeons. Powerful enemies and just a single type of puzzle to conquer. It's still fun. At the bottom, you find that humanity's sloth has manifested as the Holy Grail, and it's here where I witness the game's ultimate visual metaphor. The public has grown complicit with disorder and chaos, and therefore grown complicit with sin. Kamoshida's lust, Madarame's vanity, Kaneshiro's gluttony, Okumura's greed, Shido's pride, and our own sloth. I loved this revelation. Also, yeah, uh, another boss fight with God. Yaldabaoth balances sin in the form of his many weapons, and if he has more than one out at once, you can say goodbye to your life. The amount of micromanagement and fear in this lengthy boss fight really intimidated me, but it made for one of my favorite fights in Persona history. Persona 5 has a lot of fantastic bosses, and I've made it clear how much I love a good boss fight in these games, so Yaldabaoth wound things down in the best of ways. In the end... We made our impact on the world. The Phantom Thieves gave people hope and strength, and I finally head home with memories of my friends and foes to last a lifetime. Or at least, that's how the original Persona 5 ended.
Released this March, Persona 5 Royal proved to be the definitive version of the game, hands down. Aside from stuff like great quality of life changes, Akechi becoming a confidant, the addition of Showtime attacks, and actually making mementos fun, Royal also adds a couple of new characters, Kasumi Yoshizawa and Takuto Maruki. Throughout the course of the game, Kasumi shows up irregularly and her confidant maxes out at level 5. She's an energetic and inspiring girl that loves gymnastics. Although she resents the Phantom Thieves and their methods, I am willing to understand where she's coming from. Maruki is assigned to me for mandatory counseling, but he seems understanding and trustworthy and it feels nice to be able to confide in him. All of the Phantom Thieves have scenes with him actually. They talk about things that are troubling them, and he seems genuinely interested in offering assistance. I strike a deal with him to help him research cognitive science, while he works me through my issues and I make the most of my mandatory counseling. In October, Kasumi and I ran into a palace in the middle of the city. The music is beautiful, and it takes on the look of a pale yet abstract convention center, a subdued version of Madarame's palace. Here, Kasumi awakens her persona, although we don't know why or how just yet. She seemed to be going through something substantial, and I couldn't wait to find out what that was. On the night Nijima asks me to turn myself in, Akechi miraculously shows up, unscathed, and agrees to assist with the case. Excuse me? He's alive? Something definitely wasn't right. Things are going too well. On January 1st, you awaken in the nurse's office, and this is where I realized what was going on. Over the course of the game, Maruki was cooking something up. I didn't know what it was, and I wasn't prepared for what was about to happen. Uh, okay, this is, uh, bizarre. The next day, I meet up with Akechi of all people to discuss what's going on. Apparently, he is the only one that is actually conscious of his surroundings. I don't know how he figured it out, but I'm not going to say no to this guy. From here, Akechi became undoubtedly one of my favorite characters. Every line is spoken with a hint of disdain. His dialogue and personality in battle is unhinged. It's lovely. After infiltrating the palace for a while with Kasumi and Akechi, we run into you know who. He set up this elaborate scheme to make Kasumi relive the death of her sister. The thing is, Kasumi is actually Sumire and she assumed her younger sister's identity, personality, and even her hobbies to cope with the loss. Things changed for her, and for me, on a dime. And this is reflected in the first thing Maruki says to you. I really hope this helped you understand. If you keep pushing on like this, you're going to find nothing but heartache. Maruki has said some things throughout his confidant that should have immediately raised red flags within me. Specifically, this one line sticks out to me. He says, I think if pain could be avoided, it should be. Maybe it shouldn't exist at all. Yes, life would be much more enjoyable if we could eliminate all hardships, but those trials and tribulations are what make us stronger. Maruki found it so difficult to deal with his ex-girlfriend's coma and the loss of her parents that instead of working through that pain, he wiped it all from her memory, including memories of their relationship and cut ties with her. I shouldn't have to tell you why ignoring your problems is unhealthy, but in Maruki's case, I didn't hate him for this. He had an extreme reaction to grief, but it was a human reaction nonetheless. Why should we have to deal with life's problems? Why do they exist in the first place? They're questions without an answer, and rather than facing that reality, he created his own and he forced it on everyone else. Living in blissful ignorance, being complicit with the way things are, and not seeking the truth. A summation of the three Hashino games. I don't hate Maruki for this. He went a different way and I wanted to show him the light. After awakening my friends to the truth, we all progressed through the palace together, learning things about Maruki as we went along. I wanted to save him rather than defeat him. Even when you send the calling card, it's done over a civil discussion with some coffee. God, what a great character. He's easily my favorite villain in a Persona game, no question. This palace is phenomenal. The puzzles that lock the doors all pertain to Maruki's misguided nature, and the music hits even harder than it did back in October. The song is called Gentle Madman and it weaves the tragedy, softness, and misdirection of Maruki's character together into one of my favorite Shoji Meguro compositions. This dungeon was unique because up until now, every single antagonist in this game was deplorable. But not Maruki. I was concerned for him. There are a couple sections in this dungeon that stand out to me. First, the testing room. You need to answer the questions in a similar vein of Maruki's way of thinking, otherwise you'll have to face a shadow. It contextualizes even more of his actions, and it can be a bit of a brain bender. Speaking of brain benders, I adore this puzzle too. You need to maneuver around this area and mix colors together in order to form bridges to your objective. 
The final fight is nothing short of amazing. The music, the hesitance to fight, and the overall strategy you have to employ to keep his tentacles from healing and protecting him as you desperately avoid attacks, debuffs, and status effects, it all makes for the only final boss that could ever top Yaldabaoth. And in the end, after endless fighting in the most over-the-top, anime-esque fashion, you beat each other up all Naruto finale style. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to hurt him anymore. I didn't want any more suffering, and neither did he. We wanted the same thing in very different ways. After finishing him off, life goes back to normal. Sumire takes things one day at a time, and Akechi, well, I don't know. All I know is, my friends and fans get me out of jail, and things play out the way they were actually meant to be. I say goodbye to my friends, and a reformed taxi driving Maruki escorts me to the station, and my time with Persona 5 finally comes to an end. Persona 5 Royal was directed by the new guy, Daiki Ito. Katsura Hashino has since formed a new studio within Atlas and retired from Persona. If Ito-san can write villains like Maruki and fit them into a narrative that already exists seamlessly, and end up enhancing the entire game as a result, a game that was already incredible, mind you, imagine what he will do with Persona 6 when it eventually releases. I have nothing but faith in him. Two months later, and it's all over. I've played through Persona 3, 4, and 5 in their entirety. But the Persona virus never truly leaves your system. I listen to the music on bike rides and while I'm running daily errands. I think about the characters at least once a day, and I'm buying spin-off games left and right. A Persona fighting game? Uh, sure, I'll bite. Hey, this is pretty good. Oh, there's another one with more characters? Guess I'm buying that one too. Hey, this game's got Persona characters in it, I guess I'll cave. Persona Q? Never played Etrian Odyssey, but sure, why not? Persona dancing games? <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> oh shit, I bought them. Atlas is making these goofy spin-off games left and right and preying on desperate fans like me, and for some reason I refuse to complain. It's here where the impact of this series truly hit me. Katsura Hashino has revamped the series, defining it and making it an unforgettable experience for nearly 15 years. I caught up on all the media, a ton of jokes, and a general sense of passion for these games. They were a huge part of people's lives. Still are! Through all of the aspects of these games that I might make fun of, they're still a part of what I fell in love with as a whole. Persona is just as much about those summer days you spend with your friends as it is dunking on Morgana or shooting yourself in the head. It's sometimes preachy or corny writing is balanced out by powerful messages, strong characters, and some of the most fun I've ever had and will ever have with the role-playing genre. When someone finally asks me how I spent my summer during this cursed year, I can say I played Persona all summer without feeling guilty. <laughs> 2020 has been a terrible year for everyone. No matter who you are or where you're from, you've felt the impact. But because something truly enlightening has happened to me from the comfort of my own home, just by playing these stupid, wonderful, hokey, heartfelt, cheesy, emotional games, I realized something. You remember how we knew we would die in Persona 3, and yet we still bit the bullet? Or how we knew the truth hurt in Persona 4, yet we still faced ourselves anyway? Or how we laughed in the face of adversity in Persona 5? Every hardship is an opportunity for growth. Everything I was looking forward to had been cancelled this year. I was going to go to E3 for the first time ever, hang out with friends I never get to see at conventions throughout the summer, and eventually fulfill a lifelong dream of going to Japan. All thanks to you guys! You all enabled me to do these things. And now, all of these things have been put on hold indefinitely. I know I'll be able to do them one day, but I don't know when that day will come. At first, I sat alone at my desk day by day, just sulking. Until one day I couldn't take it anymore. So many things were out of my control, and just as I had thought things were in my grasp, they were taken from me. Instead of worrying about the uncontrollable, I decided to do something with my time. I made videos I'm proud of out of passion for what I do, I played games I'd never be able to otherwise, I reconnected with friends I rarely speak to, I started losing weight so that I'd be happier with myself, and I continued with my Japanese studies so that I'd be able to read and speak the language when I eventually take that dream trip. I turned what was initially an inconvenience into an opportunity to change things for the better. Do with this information what you will, but I believe Persona's messages played a part in inspiring me. I completely understand the undying passion for this series, and I'm here for it now. These stories and characters are real to us because we've lived with them and made choices that influence their lives, even if they're just fictional. And if we're making choices for their sake, 
Perhaps we can do the same for ourselves. And that is how I fell in love with Persona. I've been Liam Triforce, and I'd like to thank you for watching.